In November of 1620, 41 travelers signed the Mayflower Compact. After a long journey and a few near mutinies, they didn't teach us about that in school, but there were a couple of near mutinies. The colonists agreed to work together, quote, for our better ordering and preservation as shall be thought most convenient for the general good of the colony unto which we promise all due submission and obedience. John Carver helped write the compact and he was the first to sign it. He then became the first governor of Plymouth Colony, but he only lived another five months before his death. The rest of the pilgrims carried on. 403 years later, the effects of their pilgrimage still ripple through human history. Now, after decades of failure and strife and struggle, our text tonight is going to show God's chosen family finally united in heart, united in purpose. Circumstances and providence have led them back into a life of pilgrimage. God set Abraham out on a life of pilgrimage. Uh, Isaac followed that up. This generation of the family has not been doing so hot as far as spiritual pilgrimage goes. But what kind of pilgrims would they be? Would they act the way they did back in Genesis 34 when they sojourned to Shechem and left a ghost town soaked in blood? Or would they follow in the steps of faithful Abraham, the friend of God? The Joseph saga as a whole is a great story of redemption. These sons of Jacob, who were some of the worst men in the book, we see here transformed by God's grace. As they once again take up the pilgrim's progress, we see that instead of violence, there is service. Instead of rivalry, there is humility. Instead of schemes, there is honesty. Instead of greed, there is grace. And now finally, even though they find themselves outside the land of promise, they are able to be the blessing that God has always wanted this family to be. Let's begin in verse 28. Now Jacob had sent Judah ahead of him to Joseph to prepare for his arrival at Goshen. Hold there. Goshen is in the northeastern part of the land of Egypt. The name is a Hebrew one, not Egyptian. Later in the text, it will be referred to as the land of Ramses. That's the Egyptian name. And the name refers to a place of rich soil. It would be an ideal spot for them to graze their flocks and herds. At this point, Joseph has lived in Egypt longer than he lived in Canaan. He was taken at age 17. It's now about 22 years later, give or take. While he retains aspects of his Hebrew heritage, like his worship of the one true God, in many other ways, he's totally assimilated into Egyptian culture, uh, sort of because he was forced into that as a slave and then conscripted into service in the palace, but he's very assimilated. He looks like an Egyptian, he walks like an Egyptian, he talks like an Egyptian, he does all of that kind of stuff. Judah, as a character, continues to occupy a position of servant leadership in the family. Abraham, we recall, had one son, at least one son uh, in the chosen line of God, Isaac. Isaac then had two sons. The families were staying pretty small back then. But now the family is much larger, more than 70 people, as we saw last time. As Jacob's life clearly comes to a close, the natural question becomes, who is going to lead this group? God is still planning to work through this particular family, and the family now looks much different than it did a generation or two generations ago. Two generations ago, it's three people, right, with some servants and herds and things like that. One generation ago, it's a guy, his wife, and their twin boys, right? And now we're talking about 12 sons with their sons and their daughters, and it has uh, sort of exploded inside. Who's going to lead? Uh, even though, uh, well, it would have been a question, because if Jacob would have had his way, he was going to have Joseph, his favorite son, lead, right? He was grooming Joseph to be the leader way back when he was 17 years old. He was putting him in a position of authority over his brothers. That's one of the things that led to his uh, being trafficked into Egypt. 
But then they thought Joseph was dead for the last two decades, and he's out of the picture. And even though they're together again in Egypt, it's not very realistic that Joseph would be allowed to leave his service to Pharaoh in Egypt. He's the prime minister of Egypt. It's not really the kind of thing he can just say, I'm you know, retiring early to spend time with my family. Uh, that's not what he can do. And so Jacob's favorite son isn't really going to be that person. Jacob's firstborn of the family was totally disqualified, Reuben. We've been over that before. The couple of old boys after that were also disqualified. And plus, we've seen again and again in Genesis that God has often a different idea than simply going with the oldest, right? It was Abel, not Cain. It was Isaac, not Ishmael. It was Jacob, not Esau. So who's going to lead this group? Judah has become to Jacob what Joseph became to Pharaoh. He's the prime minister of the family at this point. He's standing in that position, offering himself, being the go-between, being the person to, to take the reins when needs be. And eventually, his line would not only be established as the royal line, but more importantly, the messianic line. And so that's what we're seeing here. Verse 28 continues, when they came to the land of Goshen, Joseph hitched the horses to his chariot and went up to Goshen to meet his father Israel. Joseph presented himself to him, threw his arms around him, and wept for a long time. Hearing that his father had finally crossed the borders and arrived, Joseph, the most important man in the most powerful kingdom, didn't wait for a servant to prep his horses and chariot. He hitched the horses himself. This is a picture of haste, a picture of urgency, a picture of excitement and exuberance. Now, this would have been like the presidential motorcade. I don't know if you've ever actually seen a presidential motorcade, you know, roll through town, uh, but it's a big deal. Uh, Joseph probably had quite a few servants with him and runners surrounding him as he traveled. In fact, the language suggests how overwhelming his arrival was. When it says there that Joseph presented himself to his father, the text uses a specific term that is always elsewhere used in Genesis for a theophany, an appearance of God to men. Such was Joseph's power, his grandeur, his grace, his majesty. Uh, one, one scholar points out that he was riding in a vehicle that didn't exist in Canaan. There weren't chariots. And he rolls up in this thing surrounded in, in the, the trappings of the palace and all of his power. Now, as we move through the world, we are appointed as heavenly ambassadors, right? If you're a Christian, you've been appointed by God to be his representative, to be his ambassador to the world. And as ambassadors... We, we go and meet with people, we interact with people, we, uh, you know, move ourselves down the roads of life, but uh, on the spiritual level, we are meant to operate on a whole different level than everybody else, right? Uh, we, when it comes to circumstances, when it comes to our outlook, our worldview, when it comes to our decision-making, it's supposed to be different. It's supposed to be very, very stark in comparison to the way the rest of the world does things. When we arrive on scene, as it were, hopefully we give an impression of God's grace and His provision and His power and His grandeur and His majesty and His willingness to work through vessels like us. A little devotional thought from Joseph's arrival there. Verse 30, and then Israel said to Joseph, I'm ready to die now because I've seen your face and you are still alive. Commentators point out that Nearly all of Jacob's words after Genesis 37 have been about death. Genesis 37, when Joseph is taken from him, pretty much every time he talks, he's talking about death and, and, and how bad it's going to be. He's often talking about how I'm going to go down to Sheol, to the grave in sorrow because of what has happened. He talks about it again and again and again. And then after the grief of Joseph has just crushed him as a, uh, it crushed his spirit. Then they're saying, hey, we got to take Benjamin with us to Egypt. And he says, you can't do this. You already took Joseph. That's bringing me down in sorrow. And you bring Benjamin, man, that's going to kill me. And I'm just going to be wallowing in the sorrow of death, Right. From chapter 37 to chapter 46, we, we, we have to conclude that Jacob wasn't particularly faith-filled. He wasn't particularly following after the Lord. 
but now he's back on his pilgrimage. Remember, the Lord appeared to him in the last passage and said, don't be afraid, this is what I want you to do. He had paused there in Beersheba to wait on the Lord, to worship God, say, God, what's your opinion on this move? What do you want me to do? So he's back into that pilgrim lifestyle that they've been called into. And we see now that his attitude toward death has changed. Now he has peace that he didn't have before. He doesn't have a death wish, but he's being realistic. He's 130 years old, right? Death is going to come knocking. He knows that. But now he says, I'm ready to die. Your text may say, let me die. He's not saying he wants to die, but he's saying, I'm ready to die. I'm not afraid of it anymore. It's not a, a sorrowful adversary to me anymore. Derek Kidner writes, Jacob's bitterness is largely replaced by a sense of fulfillment and hope. Death is the same. He knows that he's headed towards the end of his mortal life, but he's no longer speaking of it the same way. He has peace now and hope now and fulfillment now. Unless you and I are taken to heaven in the rapture, we are all headed to heaven through the tunnel of death, right? As pilgrims, We don't need to have a death wish. We don't need to be excited about the process of death. But we trust our Lord. And because we trust Him and because He has made very sure guarantees to us about death, we can be ready for it. It's no longer a looming enemy. It is simply a passageway from where we are to where we want to be. And so we don't have to be excited about it, but we don't have to be afraid of it. And we can know that it is no longer an enemy. It is vanquished. There's no more sting in death. There's no more victory in death. Jesus Christ took care of that. If you're a Christian, death is simply a a corridor you pass through to get from this life to the next. After their long and emotional reunion, Joseph starts coaching his brothers on how they are going to proceed. Verse 31, Joseph said to his brothers and his father's family, I'll go up and inform Pharaoh, telling him, my brothers and my father's family who were in the land of Canaan have come to me. The men are shepherds. They also raise livestock. They have brought their flocks and herds and all that they have. When Pharaoh addresses you and asks, what's your occupation? You're to say, your servants, both we and our ancestors have raised livestock from our youth until now. Then you will be allowed to settle in the land of Goshen since all shepherds are detestable to Egyptians." So that's how it's going to be? Yep, that's how it's going to be. We're detestable to the people here? Yeah, you are detestable to the Egyptians. That's the answer. The answer was yes. This Hebrew family would never be accepted into Egyptian society unless, of course, they abandoned their God, abandoned their heritage, abandoned their calling, abandoned their special place in this world. Then, I suppose, they would have been able to assimilate into Egyptian society. But the truth is they needed to be separate. God needed them to be separate, and they needed to be separate from Egyptian culture too. And Joseph knew that. In Egypt, it was an abomination to sacrifice a lamb or a ram. To do so showed contempt for one of their many gods, Amun. He was the king of the gods, and if you sacri- he was a ram. And if you sacrificed a ram or a lamb, it was an abomination, and it was a real problem. Moses references this danger in Exodus 8, 26. You remember at one point, Pharaoh over Moses said, well, take your people, you can't leave, but go and do your offerings in the land, in Egypt. And he says, we can't do that. They'll kill us if we do that because we're here to sacrifice lambs and sheep. And that was a big no-no in Egypt. Egypt was the kind of place where they might impale you on a stick for not getting on board with their gods. Uh, I learned a couple interesting facts about Egypt and what they were into at that time. If you trespassed into an Egyptian funerary district, you remember Egyptians were deep into how they buried people, right? That's why they're building pyramids, mummification, all this stuff. We still make movies about it, and we still make Marvel shows about it, right? All of this stuff. If you found yourself in a funerary district and you weren't a priest, you could be burned alive. For, for, for that trespass. Uh, if you disrupted what they call the funerary cult uh, and the idea of the, the, the traditions and the rituals and things like that, they would kill you for it. Egyptians did a lot of really strange things, a bunch that are not uh, mentionable in polite company. 
But I'll mention a couple strange things that they did. Did you know, and this is true, when the family cat died, they would have pet cats. When the family pet cat died in Egypt, Egyptians would shave off their eyebrows in mourning. So that's what I expect from now on from any of you cat people. Uh, they also saw feces, animal feces, as a sign of immortality because uh, the scarab beetles would lay their eggs in it and come out of it. Really nice. Anybody have dinner already tonight? And then the, the beetles would push the little dung balls, right? You've seen that on planet Earth and things like that. And so they saw it as a sign of immortality, and so they would use feces in all sorts of very upsetting ways. Medicinally, in all these different things, they would be using poop for it and being very excited about that. Meanwhile, you have Hebrews, right? So we got a real problem here because the family of faith was going to continue to worship God in the way he asked them to, by doing things like not being into feces and by doing things like sacrificing sheep and rams. Uh, they would have to stay separate, not only for their own spiritual health, not only so that they wouldn't pollute the chosen line and be assimilated into the, the Gentile nations and cease to exist as a separate people, but also because if the more they mingled with the Egyptian culture, the more dangerous it would be, not just spiritually, but physically. They might find themselves impaled on a stick. And so Joseph's plan to settle them in Goshen would mean that they were on the outskirts, the far boundary of Egypt, of the kingdom, and would be able to thrive away from the dangers and the influence of Egyptian culture. It was a good plan. Joseph explains that the Egyptians were just not going to think very highly of them no matter what. You're detestable to them. They'd be viewed as other They'd be seen as nomadic hayseeds who don't do things right and have different priorities. And you know what? That's okay. Because believers are different. The people in the family of faith, we are different. We are other than this lost and dying world. We do have a different way of doing things. We have much different priorities, or at least we're supposed to. We don't want to assimilate into the dung-loving culture of this world. And they may turn their noses up at us, but we understand like, yeah, but you're enslaved to sin and I've been set free. You're celebrating darkness. I'm a child of the king celebrating light. And so who cares if a dung-loving world turns their nose up at you? We're, uh, we're called out to be something much different. Now, at the same time, we see that the family was, was happy to live at peace in Goshen. They weren't saying, okay, and then we're going to battle these Egyptians and and crush them and wipe them out. They weren't trying to start trouble at all. They also weren't trying to hide who they were. Joseph instructs them what to say, and he, he doesn't tell them to lie. In fact, the opposite. He encourages them to be honest, even if that makes Pharaoh wrinkle his nose at them. He says, hey, tell him the truth. And the truth is, this is who we are, and this is what we do, and this is how we do it. And if Pharaoh turns up his nose and he says, oh, you're shepherds, you're monotheists, you don't rub poop all over yourselves, gross. Okay, but just but tell the truth. Don't try to hide who you are. Don't try to hide the fact that you're a monotheist. Don't try to hide the fact that your culture is different than the world culture. There's a beautiful picture of Christ here. If Joseph wasn't there, if Joseph wasn't with them, if Joseph wasn't bringing them to Pharaoh and Pharaoh to them, if they were just one of the thousands and thousands of refugee families coming in for help during this famine and they tried to appear before Pharaoh, would he have received them? Would he have said, yeah, bring in these 70 people from someplace I've never heard of and sure, let me start giving them things. Would he have done that? Of course not. He would have sent these country mice packing, but they were hidden in Joseph, right? Because there were any friend of Joseph is a friend of mine, is the idea. And they were hidden in Joseph. And because of Joseph, the Savior, they were able to receive all that they needed. Just as we are hidden in Christ. And because of that, we are given a place at the table. We're given a place in the kingdom. When the, when the king looks at us, he sees not us. He sees the, the son who, who he loves so much. And he says, great. And if Joseph's fine with you, then I'm fine with you. Now, God is not like Pharaoh in the sense that he has to be convinced to love us. He loves us the same way Christ loves us. But we see this beautiful picture here. 
of what was possible because the Savior's son was in position to bring strangers into the kingdom. Verse 1 of chapter 47. So Joseph went and informed Pharaoh, my father and my brothers with their flocks and herds and all that they own have come from the land of Canaan and now are in the land of Goshen. By referencing their flocks and herds, Joseph is accomplishing a couple of things. He's laying the groundwork for his family to be able to live in a good grazing area. And he's also showing that they're not going to be an economic burden on Egypt. They're not going to leech off the palace. They're hardworking, industrious people. He's not saying, hey, I've got all of these brothers here and they're all going to need government jobs, right? He, he says, hey, they're, they're over here. They're going to need grazing land, but we've got grazing land and it's over there and they're already there, hint, hint, and they're not going to be a drain on the, the society here. Now, we are pilgrims living in a foreign land, according to the Bible. This world is not our home. We're headed to our final home, the New Jerusalem. As we navigate, we should endeavor to make ourselves a benefit, not a burden to the society around us. We want to be peaches, not leeches, right? That's the idea. Bearing fruit, making the place God has scattered us better. He says, what I want to happen through your life is for you to be established like a tree planted by rivers of water so that you're bringing forth fruit season after season. And even though, you know, I'm not a horticulturalist, but the, 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 the peach on the peach tree is not really for the tree, it's for others around it, right? And then it reproduces and all of those sorts of things. But God says, I want you to be a benefit and a blessing in the place that I have scattered you. Verse 2, he took five of his brothers and prevented that, presented them to Pharaoh. So Joseph decided, uh, we don't need all 11 brothers at this meeting, uh, historically, this has not been the strongest group when it comes to group decisions or meetings or those sorts of things. I do wonder how this schoolyard pick, okay, how it went. Okay, here's the thing. We're going to go see Pharaoh, maybe just five of you, maybe just the following five of you, and the rest of you, why don't you just hang out here? Uh, Joseph, it's a kind of a delicate situation, uh, and Joseph is being a wise in a good way. Throughout this passage, he's demonstrating what Jesus taught us in Matthew 10. He said, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Be shrewd as serpents, innocent as doves, right? So he's thinking, he's like, you know, it's probably only going to go badly if I have all of these people show up and all of them start talking. Why don't I just pick a couple of them that can handle themselves? Verse 3, and Pharaoh asked his brothers, what is your occupation? And they said to Pharaoh, your servants, both we and our ancestors are shepherds. And they said to Pharaoh, we've come to stay in the land for a while because there's no grazing land for your servants, sheep, since the famine in the land of Canaan has been severe. So now, please let your servants settle in the land of Goshen. Okay, so they didn't say exactly what Joseph had coached them to say. Joseph had coached them very carefully, and they didn't get it quite right. They mentioned Goshen themselves instead of letting Pharaoh offer it to them. That's a little bit of a faux pas. And they used the word for shepherds that a lot of commentators think that Joseph was specifically wanting them to avoid. He used a specific term. He said, tell, tell Pharaoh you raise livestock because that's true, but let's avoid discussion about sheep. Let's just avoid discussion about rams. Let's just say you raise livestock, right? Uh, but they said, we raise sheep, we're shepherds. Can we stay in Goshen? And they're like, okay, <laughs> okay. And uh, Joseph is probably like biting his nails thinking like, this is, this is why I only wanted five of you. I should have brought just three of these guys. But, but it worked out because Pharaoh didn't need much convincing. He was already on board with all of this. Now, we're not always going to say the exact right thing as spiritual pilgrims, right? Do you ever say the exact right thing when, when you feel like the Lord is prompting you to share something with somebody or, or when a, a non-believing coworker comes up to you and says, you know, this happened in my life. Why would God allow that to happen to you? Do you really feel like I said the exact right thing every time somebody asks me something like that? We don't say the exact right thing, but the Lord is with us and His grace is operating even when we don't execute perfectly and that's a great relief. Because we don't stand before the, the courts of the world or, or the, the people around us who are seeking answers. We don't stand there alone. We stand there filled with the presence of the Holy Spirit. When they said, we have come to stay in the land, the brothers used a term for a temporary visit. When they said, settle in the land, a few moments later, they used one that means a long-term settlement. As pilgrims, we are here 
for a long-term temporary visit, right? That's what life is. And I don't know how long your long-term temporary visit is going to be. For some people, it's uh, more long-term than others. But that, that's us. God encourages us to settle down where he's called us to be, but to keep in mind that this is not our forever home. The brothers do a great job in this speech. They reveal that they had no intention of becoming Egyptian, right? They, 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 they mark themselves out as saying, hey, we're Canaanites, in the, we, not Canaanites in nationality, but we live in Canaan. And we intend to be back in Canaan at some point. We don't intend to just get Egyptian citizenship. Uh, and so, but they also weren't a threat to Pharaoh and there's people. They, they said, hey, we're not here to invade. We're not here to take anything. We're here for a while. And in fact, three times they identified themselves to Pharaoh as servants. They said, hey, we're your servants. They say it three times. And essentially, they're telling Pharaoh that they can look after themselves, but they intend to be a blessing to the people around them too. And while they speak, they gave Pharaoh appropriate respect, appropriate honor, even though he was who he was, right? I mean, on, on the cosmic spiritual level, they would have looked at Pharaoh and thought, this is a pagan unbeliever who has nothing to do with us. But he, they gave him respect. They gave him honor. You know why? Because even though he was Pharaoh of Egypt, he wasn't their enemy. He was their neighbor now. Now, there would come a time when the Pharaoh of Egypt, not this one, but a different one, became the enemy of God's people. Moses and Pharaoh, that Pharaoh, made himself God's enemy and the enemy of God's people. And Moses kept telling him, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. We don't want these plagues to happen to you. We don't want these plagues to destroy your people. We don't want your firstborn son to die. And he said, no, I'm your enemy. And therefore, uh, God repaid him wrath when he could have given him mercy uh, if, if Pharaoh would have gone along with that. And so these guys are honorable toward Pharaoh, respectful toward Pharaoh because he wasn't their enemy, he was their neighbor. Verse five, then Pharaoh said to Joseph, now that your father and brothers have come to you, the land of Egypt is open before you. Settle your father and brothers in the best part of the land. They can live in the land of Goshen. If you know any capable men among them, put them in charge of my livestock. Another foreshadow of Christ here, the son bridges the gap for those he loves because of his willingness, because of his sacrifice, because of his uh, obedience to his God. Strangers are able to be brought in and given the best of the kingdom. They are then given positions in the king's court. Being in charge of the livestock, if they took this job, would mean that they were officers of the crown enjoying protections not usually accorded to foreigners. All because Joseph was willing to do what Joseph did. Verse 7, Joseph then brought his father Jacob and presented him to Pharaoh, and Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Joseph pictures Christ again as he presents his weak father before the king. In Jude 24, we see this sort of directed at us. We read this, Now to him who is able to protect you from stumbling and make you stand in the presence of his glory without blemish and without great joy. Remember, when they left Canaan, the, the brothers had to take, take Jacob and put him in the wagon. Uh, Jacob was a, a limper. He was hobbled by his wrestling with the Lord. And so this beautiful picture of, of Joseph not just saying, here's my dad, but going to his dad and helping him stand and walking him to the throne and, and presenting him before the king in all of his weakness. But Joseph is extending his strength and his position and his grace to Jacob. That's what the Lord's going to do for you one day if you're a believer. Jacob the pilgrim takes initiative in this scene. He doesn't wait to bless Pharaoh. He's living out God's original call to Abraham back in Genesis 12. All the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. That's what God wants for his people, for us to be a blessing so that many may be drawn to faith in Jesus Christ. Jacob understood that God's calling on his life put him on a completely different plane than the rest of humanity. This was the great king who controlled the greatest empire on earth, but Jacob approached him as if Pharaoh was the inferior party who needed blessing, because the truth was he was. From the perspective of heaven, Jacob is the superior, Pharaoh is the inferior. Yes, Pharaoh had a palace, but Jacob had a promise, and which one lasted forever? The promise. 
Pharaoh kept talking economically in this scene, but Jacob now brings the Lord into the situation. He brings spirituality into the scene. And it's a lovely insight from one commentator when we read, members of the chosen family include within the circle of blessing even those who seem least in need of it and who are going to be problems in the future. Now, Jacob knew that prophecy that God had given Abraham that the descendants of Abraham would be slaves for 400 years. He can do the math. He knows this is probably what's going to happen. Pharaoh and his, his descendants are going to become a problem for Jacob's descendants one day. Pharaoh is the least person in need of a blessing on the face of the earth. And yet he says, but you know what? From heaven's perspective, I still want to give it to you. And that's grace. What a beautiful thing. Jacob has not demonstrated a lot of graciousness in his story, but it's flowing through him here. Eugene Roop reminds us that blessing is a royal and priestly responsibility. That's who blesses people, people who are royal, people who are priests. Wouldn't you know it, God has made you a royal priest. We are a royal priesthood, the New Testament says, sent out to proclaim praises and conduct ourselves honorably in an unbelieving world, fearing God and loving others and doing good works. Verse 8 says, Pharaoh said to Jacob, how many years have you lived? Jacob said to Pharaoh, my pilgrimage has lasted 130 years. My years have been few and hard, and they have not yet reached the years of my ancestors during their pilgrimages. So in Egyptian culture, the perfect ideal age was 110 years. Now here's a man who has attained a life that was from one cultural perspective more than they could ever hope for. He's 130. They saw Jacob and said, man, you got to tell me about your life. Because you're way beyond, not just life expectancy, but all we could ever hope for, for living. And Jacob's response was honest. He said, listen, it's not just about my years. It's about a pilgrimage that I'm on. He keeps using that term. The years of this pilgrimage have been difficult. Your version may say, might use the word evil, but that's not what Jacob means to say. The the term he uses refers to pain and difficulty and sorrow. And the truth is, Jacob had made things hard for himself so often in life when he failed to follow God, when he stumbled into greed or bitterness or scheming. We see that, yeah, he's in the court of Pharaoh, but he's not starstruck. He doesn't start boasting in his presence, well, all of Canaan belongs to me, right? And great kings are going to come for me. He doesn't do any of that. No, his answer was honest and and was vulnerable and open. And he just revealed that human life isn't about the treasures we hoard or the comforts we enjoy or the size of our pyramids. It's about the sojourn we take with a living God. Verse 10, so Jacob blessed Pharaoh and departed from Pharaoh's presence. Gordon Wenham points out that Jacob, who previously had been the one to cheat and to steal to get blessings for himself is now more than willing to dole them out, even to a stranger like Pharaoh. What a great transformation. We may be outsiders. We may be weak, limping our way through life. But we are in a position to bless a lost and dying world. We bless by being full of grace toward people. We bless by serving others. We bless with our testimony of God's faithfulness. We bless by our prayers. We bless others by demonstrating that there's more to life than this world. That it's spirit, not status. That it's faith, not fame. That it's a relationship with the Lord that matters and not these things that the world is so excited about. Verse 11, then Joseph settled his father and brothers in the land of Egypt and gave them property in the best part of the land, the land of Ramses, as Pharaoh had commanded. And Joseph provided his father, his brothers, and all his father's family with food for their dependents. So Joseph secured property and provision for them. This is an amazing testament to God's grace towards his people when we walk with him. While all the world was hungry, they were full. While all of Egypt was forfeiting their land to Pharaoh, we'll see next time, Pharaoh's, or Joseph's family was receiving a permanent land holding from the king. While the world shriveled under famine, God's people thrived and grew and became a nation. Pilgrimage with God leads to strength and provision and protection and a permanent place in his kingdom. And it doesn't matter what's going on circumstantially in the world around us. It doesn't matter what the rest of the world is doing or worshiping or what sorts of droughts or wars are raging. We're God's people. 
And we're on a different walk with him, so what kind of pilgrims are we going to be?